of new faces, um, some students will welcome um, to the Center of Religion and Chinese Society. Um, as we just mentioned, we've been here at Purdue. This center has been for just over 10 years, and occasionally we'll have the opportunity to have some visiting lecturers or even uh, internal lectures or talks. And so if you, in the future, see any announcements for us, um, please feel free to, um, you're welcome to join any of the talks that we have, and you're welcome to follow us on Facebook and, and keep track of some of the joins that, that we have here at the center. Um, but we're very happy today to be able to welcome Professor Peter Vanderveer, um, who I've, I've known for a few years, and, and he has been a great encouragement to me personally and my studies, um, and so we're happy to have him here. He's visiting the University of Chicago for a couple months, um, and he's made the trip down today to give a talk. Tomorrow morning, we'll be lucky to also have his wife, Pam is going to give a talk, and so if you have a chance to attend that, that'll be interesting tomorrow morning at 10, uh, here also in this room. Um, so let me introduce uh, Peter here. Peter Vanderveer is currently the Provost Distinguished Visiting Professor at the University of Chicago. Um, he is the Director of the Mac, at the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Religious and Ethnic Diversity in Göttingen, and Distinguished University Professor at Utrecht University. He is an elected fellow of the Royal Dutch Academy of Arts and Sciences, he has worked extensively on religion and nationalism in India, China, and Europe. Among his many publications are Gods on Earth, Religious Nationalism, Imperial Encounters, The Modern Spirit of Asia, The Handbook of Religion, and The Asian City, and The Value of Comparison. And so we're very happy to have Professor Vanderveer with us uh, this afternoon. Well, thank you very much, uh, and it's a... Uh a great pleasure uh, to be here, uh, and um, so f first of all, uh, because I've been, of course, looking over the years at what uh, Professor Van Gogh Young has been doing here, and basically worldwide, is connecting people, uh, working on uh, Chinese religion, and um, um, has therefore been an enormous influence also on um, on my students, on. Uh, the postdocs at the Max Planck and, and on myself. Uh, not that we always agree, obviously, uh, that's actually in the nature of uh, scholarship, but uh, it's a really, uh, in many ways, an enormous influence on, on, on Chinese studies. Uh, coming from Purdue University, um, which I always have <coughs> seen because of my uh, personal connections with. Um, uh, Indian IT engineers as an engineering uh, place, and so to have Chinese religion coming from an engineering place is uh, actually very appropriate. Uh, you may not see that as such, but I did some work on IT engineers in India, and it's it's really very important uh, yoga and um, all kinds of uh, spiritual pursuits for uh, even being able to do this kind of coding and all that. This is rather boring work, you know. So uh, to be uh, spiritually uh, um, influence is not so uh, unimportant. Yeah, and also thank you for <laughs> preparing so many scholars, including <laughs> prepare um, uh, Chris. <laughs> and then finally, we brought him here. And <laughs> so happy for you <laughs> yeah. and your for doing all this work. So yeah. Thank you. Well, Chris is obviously the connection uh, in in a very practical sense. You know, Chris um, uh, worked on shaman and lived in shaman for a very long time. And uh, since we had a, um, uh, especially with, with Kenneth Dean, a, a connection to Fujian, and from Fujian, uh, as people may know, from South China, uh, Fujian is a Dutch province, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, so the, old, uh, the oldest text on, uh, say, scholarly work on uh, Chinese religion is from a guy uh, you cannot even pronounce the name of, but it is <laughs> the Groot. Uh, and uh, the, the Groot has, of course, done these enormous volumes on Chinese religion from his uh, experience as um, basically a colonial officer uh, in the service of the uh, Dutch government. He went there to Xiamen, to Amoy, uh, to um, learn Chinese and learn about Chinese religion because the Dutch were interested in controlling the Chinese of Indonesia. And so his first uh, work is about Kongsis in uh, Borneo. And um, yeah, that's, um, <laughs> that's, a, that's an old connection with Fujian. 
and, uh, and, uh, and, and Chris has become a, a real expert uh, on Fujian, so I'm very happy uh, he's here and makes... Because China, obviously, you have to look at it uh, a little bit bigger. It's like um, Germany in that sense. Germany we now see as a, a small nation state, but the Germans were up to Russia. Uh, they were all over the place, and their cultural or civilizational influence was on the rest of Europe. Very enormously important. Um, China is a nation state uh, today, but of course uh, has influenced Korea, Vietnam, uh, Japan, uh, basically the entire the entire region. And, and maybe that is also a way of looking geographically at these these larger civilizations in Asia. You have an you could say an Indo sphere and a and a, and a Sino sphere. Uh, you have India with its enormous impact on Sri Lanka, uh, on uh, Nepal, obviously uh, Tibet, um, uh, going down to basically Laos and uh, Cambodia, everywhere where you fa find uh, uh, Buddhism, <laughs> um, uh, and especially when you find it. Uh, Theravada Buddhism or Hinayana Buddhism, uh, you will find a uh, enormous uh, Indian influence up to Vietnam, in fact. So there is where these civilizations uh, touch, uh, right? I mean, when you look at Cham uh, civilization in uh, in Vietnam, you see where uh, where the co where the connections are. Uh, and um, now in Vietnam, of course, these uh, the Chinese influence has won. <laughs> Because the Fiat won from uh, from the Cham and have uh, suppressed the Cham, but basically these are these are huge civilizational influences where um, uh, India and China touch in this in this region which we now call Southeast Asia, which is a term that only comes up after the Second World War. Uh, but the friends called it, of course, Indochina, Indochine. And that's because of their enormous awareness of this, uh, of the impact of uh, the larger histories of India and China on the region. Now, I'm not going to talk about India and China. Uh, I'll leave that uh, to Tom tomorrow. But um, I will say a little bit about, um, in very macro terms, about uh, nationalism and, uh, and modernity. Um, in my perspective, um, of course, nationalism is a is a frame, is a global framework of thinking about a society's identity. Uh, it is a um, it is partly creating that identity, and it's a reflection on that identity. So um, it has both the nation as a as a subject and as an object, you could say, and and that has touched anyone. Uh, I mean, everyone here is a nationalist. Uh, the Americans call themselves patriotic because they don't want to use that word nationalist, but it's actually the same. Uh, so everyone has become part of that uh, of that uh, national identity. Um, so that is a modern form of thinking about collective identity, uh, the nation, and um, and it is therefore not surprising that India and China see themselves or Indians and Chinese also see themselves as nations. You have to, of, of course, historically always see that that is a huge break. That it is very different from what it was before. The society saw themselves in a very different way. Uh, and there's also no doubt that that comes for a last part out of uh, Western influence. This is a modernity that is largely created in Europe, but then gets in, a sh in the second half of the ni 19th century a shape that is, uh, that is uh, formed by um, what I call the imperial encounters. Um, so na the, the nation in Europe is more and more envisaged, understood in relation to the task the nation have, has in the rest of the world. And the task, very specifically, it has to colonize and therefore civilize other people. So the uh, mission civilisatrice, uh, the civilizing uh, mission, the Dutch have it, <laughs> the French have it, the, um, the, the, the English have it obviously, and um, the Germans come a little bit late in the game, 
uh, but they also uh, have it. Um, that 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 means that in, uh, that the implication of that is that the nation is seen in relation to that imperial project, to understanding yourself as having a white man's burden or having the the need to civilize other people, and uh, having a kind of historical task in that, and that's you can show in all the writings of the second half of the 19th century. There's also, of course, a racial part of it, that uh, maybe the white race may be better suited to this and so on. But there are also cosmopolitan views of this. There's a whole range of thinking about it. But my, the point I want to make, uh, which I find important, is that uh, you cannot understand the self-understanding of the Dutch, the uh, English, and the French without its interaction with uh, Indonesia, uh, India, uh, China, that whole world that had to be, um, in a way, subjugated. Um, so a lot of things that come in the self-understanding of the West have, have been influenced by this encounter with the East. Similarly, of course, and that is much more this is, uh, I have tried to, in some writings, try to show what, what are these influences on, on, on especially English uh, uh, self-understanding. But obviously on the other side of the encounter, the, uh, the Indians and the Chinese have created an anti-colonial, anti-imperial uh, uh, nationalism that is directly, uh, of course, influenced by the imperial encounter. That is a well-known fact, of course, that everyone knows. You get all these anti-colonial movements that try to uh, under, uh, use a self-understanding of uh, the society to mobilize people to create also a nation and an independent nation state. There's also a range of ideas here, so from socialists to, um, uh, you have, uh, in, in China you have people like Kang Youwei Wei who want to um, create a kind of national religion a little bit in the model of uh, Japanese Shinto, uh, the, the same kind of development of a national uh, religion as in, in Japan. Uh, but you have also, uh, of course, uh, early Marxists and uh, people who have a, uh, uh, a, a different perspective on um, uh, what, what Chinese nationalism uh, should be. So you have to always see that nationalism is not of one, it, it is a frame. <laughs> everyone thinks in that frame, but that does not mean that everyone thinks the same. Of course, these are very different positions. People can kill each other for these different views. In India, of course, Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi was killed by other nationalists because he had, uh, he had a particular view that was not accepted by everyone. So that's the first point I want to make. Both sides of uh, the equation, as it were, um, the colonizers and the colonized are formed through the experience of colonization. That's um, uh, uh, more or less a deviant point, you could say. Um, the second point I want to make, and that's uh, also of relevance for uh, specifically here, because here uh, we have, of course, a, a center of uh, the study of religion. Um, what is the relation between religion and nationalism? And uh, what I in general would argue is that um, on all the, in all these places, religion is nationalized. So the earlier uh, competition and antagonism, and sometimes violent antagonism, of Catholics and Protestants in Europe, is being subsumed under um, and pacified under the idea that we are all English or Irish or Scottish and or British, uh, what the case may be, and that these religions are tributaries to um, uh, to the national identity. So you can be a Catholic and English. <laughs> The, the, the dominant mode is still being Protestant in English, but 
you can still be Catholic and you have a legitimate claim on being a, a citizen and a national subject uh, of, uh, of England. So that, that's on the, on the European side. And it is extremely important. If you look a little bit at the uh, European history that, and you, you understand European history as a history of warfare between the Protestant and Catholics, then, uh, and the nation state formation uh, out of that, then you see how important this kind of uh, pacification in the 19th century has been. Um, on the other side of the equation, and the colonized uh, societies, and we look now at, at, at India and uh, in China, you get, for the first time in India, Hindu identities that are nationalist. So the idea of the Hindu nation arises. You also get an idea of the Muslim nation. And in principle, in, be in the beginning, bo are both are claiming to capture the soul of the nation. Uh, but that does not lead to pacification. It leads to, in the end, it leads to the partition between India, uh, Pakistan, and ultimately Bangladesh. So um, uh, the uh, m majority, minority uh, situation in uh, India has been the, ba the basis of Indian politics till today. Uh, and uh, the major question is, uh, what is this? What is the basis of the of the Indian nation? Now, you can, of course, have a, a position in that that the Indian nation is secular. Uh, and some people have interpreted Nehru, for example, uh, as uh, the first uh, uh, prime minister of India, the leader of the Congress party after the death of, uh, of Gandhi, uh, as someone who was a secularist because he looked so modern and so on. But when you read, basically, um, uh, Nehru, Neo's writing on Indian civilization, then he focuses and he emphasizes on the Hindu past. The Hindu civilizational past is the basis even for secularists in, uh, in India. And that is a, a, a major fact. It is uh, very important to see secularism as not something that is um, everywhere the same. And secularization is everywhere the same. Sociologists have already, of course, long ago started to, uh, to focus on these differences between Europe and, and, and the United States, right? That for sociologists, that was always a little bit difficult to, to grab uh, what are the, if you have something that is a universal so historical process, a modernization and secularization of the world. Why, why is Europe then so different from, from, uh, from, uh, from the United States? Now, there are all kinds of very good historical explanations for why that is so different, but it is clear that it is very different. But India and China is also very different. India has a, uh, has a very uh, specific uh, development of secularism, which is basically the neutrality of the state in relation to uh, religion. I have a term for that, Nira Pekshana, which is not looking at these differences. Dharma Nira Pekshana. So you, uh, you tolerate religion because you don't want to use these differences as basis of distinctions for the law. Well, that already breaks down immediately because you have a different uh, civil code in India for Muslims and for Hindus. Um, so when you make these distinctions in the law, so for divorce and family rights and so on, then basically you are already in the heart of the state making uh, specific uh, uh, political distinctions. Now, India has um, a set of institutions that are inherited from the colonial state. And the colonial state, after the mutiny of the mid-19th century, has tried to steer away from religion as much as possible. Uh, because basically they are a foreign power in India, and they are just terribly afraid 
that they will be kicked out. That these are forces that they cannot control. So the, the state has a has a neutrality towards uh, or attempts a neutrality towards the new uh, 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 towards religious distinction. Now that neutrality cannot be maintained in the same way in the post-colonial period, obviously, because basically the legitimate the, the, the uh, legitimacy of the modern state depends on on elections in India. So the democratic process inevitably uses religion as one of the major mobilizing forces. This is also why on both the Hindu side and the um, uh, uh, Muslim side, um, uh, these, the uh, electoral process is the moment in which people start fighting. Uh, and. Uh, in which there is a constant attempt to get majority districts and so on before partition. And you could say partition itself is a creation of a majority electorate on the Hindu side in India and a majority electorate on the Muslim side in, in Pakistan. Um, so um, democracy cannot be neutral. <laughs> Uh, the democracy makes use of the uh, of available uh, uh, possibilities of mobilization. It's probably one of the reasons why the Chinese are so happy to have no uh, democracy. You know? um, too much unrest and too much trouble. Uh, public order is, is the is the civilization almost the civilizational uh, phantasma in uh, in China. Um, so you have a nationalization of religion like in Europe, in India, but that nationalization has not resulted in the pacification of religious difference, but ha has resulted in the mobilization of religious difference for uh, electoral purposes and then in the end for uh, the partition. Um, well, China is obviously a very different case. Um, it's not that religion is not an important factor. Also in uh, the uh, uh, period before liberalization, uh, religion uh, also, uh, like in India, has all kinds of mobilizing uh, potentials. Uh, but both the nationalist and the uh, communist, the, the, the main political protagonist, do not make of a, a primary use of religion uh, to um, uh, mobilize people. And uh, this has to do with uh, uh, the idea at the end of the 19th century in China that popular religion and what you d need for mobilization, uh, popular religion is to be suppressed. Suppressed, controlled, actually to get rid of. Uh, rid of. This is an, an opinion that is shared by the whole spectrum by Marxists, by nationalists, uh, by Confucian I, uh, guys, uh, by all kinds of people who are major ideologues of nationalism, we have to get rid of popular uh, religion because that is backwards. It's anti-scientific. And what we want is uh, make science the heart of the nationalist uh, method. That's not to say that you cannot have religion, but it has to be a religion that is of the higher moral ethical value. To some extent that can be Christianity, although there is a pro problem with Christianity because it's, it's foreign and it remains foreign. It can also be Islam in fact. There's enough in it, ethical. Uh, Buddhism is also fine. Taoism is a little bit already problematic. Because Taoism is too close to popular religion. And uh, so it's not that it doesn't exist that there are no Taoist uh, nationalists. They are there. But, um, but the major protagonists do not make use of this religion. That is the main point to mobilize like they do in India. Now, there's a number of reasons for that, uh, obviously. You don't have the same uh, number equation as in. Uh, as in India. In India you have 30% of the population 
who is Muslim and uh, at that time before the partition so it's a huge uh, and Hindus are very uh, it's a very unclear category you cannot easily uh, unify them because they basically have very different kinds of devotional practices and so on. There's no church. There's no, and there's also even, uh, Islam has more sources of centralized authority than, uh, than Hinduism. So to make Hinduism into a Hindu national, uh, a Hindu nationalism was not that easy. And uh, I've written a couple of books on, on this, how, they, how that has been, uh, how that came about. That kind of equation, number equation, you do not have in China. You have this, the weird category of Han. And now, I'm a, I, I'm a late convert to um, uh, the study of China. So I basically, I'm still puzzled. I probably go into the grave with a big puzzle. I have no idea who these Han are. Basically, what I see is an enormous diversity, linguistic diversity, an enormous ethnic diversity. I see an enormous diversity, in fact. But there is this idea that there is a huge majority that is somehow ethnically connected. Um, maybe in the discussion we can try to find out what that Han majority is. But then, of course, ethnicity is one of the other possibilities to unify in nationalism, right? Religion is one. Language is one, ethnicity is one, and language, in the Chinese case, that I can see. Uh, you use the written language, Mandarin, as a as a centralizer and a combiner. That I I, I, I do see, but um, how how this Han idea, Han nationalism, comes about? That that is uh, that's not so easy. To, but. It's therefore not really strange that the development, the historical pathway of India is different from that in, of China because, because of the understanding of numbers and the understanding of ethnicity are very different. Uh, and, and therefore the, the place, the location of religion in these nationalism is very different. Um, what we see in both cases is a nationalization of civilization. I already mentioned um, uh, Nehru in the Indian case, but I, this, is, this is a very s general uh, phenomenon. It's also a phenomenon that the uh, sociologist Nobody Lies have, has shown in, um, in his studies of Europe, uh, uh, especially France, this whole idea of uh, the idea that the basis of the nation, of national identity, is a civilizational history. So civilization becomes a very important under, uh, set of uh, concepts that are crucial to the understanding of national identity. Now that is true. So you have a Hindu civilization and you have a Han civilization in these two uh, cases. Now, let me say at least something methodologically. Uh, why would one bother uh, of... Uh, comparing India and China. It's already difficult enough to understand China and it's very, uh, clearly also very difficult to understand India. Uh, why bother? Uh, now I think what we always do is comparing and uh, what we have been doing all the time is comparing it with Europe or Euro-America with the West. So basically all sociological theories of the end of the 19th century are based on, on Europe. And uh, the later 1950s uh, development of sociology uh, in America is a re-reading of uh, the classics, Weber and Durkheim and so on, from Europe in an industrializing society. So basically our conceptual apparatus is based on comparison, but it's based on a, a very specific comparison which we don't reflect enough on. It's very useful, in my view, to compare uh, uh, within Asia and uh, to compare the different pathways of different societies. You can do that in various ways. I have no very strong ideas about that. Uh, you can look at Vietnam and China, for example. You can. 
uh, look at uh, Thailand and Vietnam, you can look at Indonesia and Malaysia, obviously. Uh, you can look at uh, several, uh, but, but um, get away a little bit away from the European uh, uh, overemphasis, in which, in, in Weberian terms, everything is a lack. Something is not really happening there. Oh, it's, uh, you know, there, there's a gap there. Yeah, it's just a different history. And it's not a failure or something. It's not a failure to modernize or something. You can see that nowadays quite clearly. That is not the case. It's a particular kind of pathway. Um, what I more specifically think with comparison is useful is that you see that the societies in, on which you focus and which you understand, you really can only see that society through the literature that you have been studying and through the, the questions that are raised in that society or about that society, for example, in Western scholarship. Uh, and you don't think out of the box, as it were. You don't think out of that particular uh, uh, scholarship. The questions that are raised in a comparable situation, like India, for example, have, are very different are totally different. These are questions that would not even emerge in the Chinese case. That gives you a possibility by contrast to see what the specificity is of the, of the Chinese development and what the specificity is of the Indian development. So through com comparison you can probably uh, surmount some of the conceptual um, black holes or uh, darknesses in the perspective that uh, are part of your training simply and of the general conversation about the countries you work on. So I've written a little book on the value of comparison uh, which I l try to lay that out, what are uh, the benefits and I also try to give a couple of examples how that would work positively for the study of India and China. Um, now let me um, go a little bit into, uh, so I, I do 45 minutes, right? That, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, a little bit into India and, and, and China. Uh, um, so what I have found very interesting uh, in both cases um, is um, the development of a an idea of spirituality in, uh, in both sides, in India and in China, in conversation with the West, you can say. Uh, so the search at the end of the 19th century for something that was not completely captured by religion, or by religious traditions, or by religious institutions. So um, you get a couple of people who think beyond religious institutions. Uh, so uh, it's not a doctrine that you learn from a Buddhist or a Taoist master. It is something you think yourself out and it is related to your understanding of civilizational, um, the ci civilizational background of your nation. Uh, so you have all kinds of figures who um, start developing uh, an idea that uh, you have in Asia uh, a stronger spirituality. That is in an intricate way related to religious traditions, but it is not subsumed by religious uh, traditions. And, um, and it has uh, several sources, like Hindu sources, Buddhist sources, Sufi sources, uh, uh, Taoist sources, uh, uh, a whole range of, of uh, new understanding of sources in conversation with uh, Western philosophy before, for example, Kant, uh, Schopenhauer and so on. Also in conversation with spiritualists in, um, in Europe and America. For India, that is very easy to show. Um, 
you only have to look at the theosophists. Uh, the theosophists, um, well, one, one of the leaders is Colonel Alcott, a uh, colonel in the Civil War uh, of the United States. After the Civil War, you have an enormous rise of spiritism in the, in the United States, uh, trying to reach the spirits uh, the, of all those people who have been massacred in the Civil War. And um, he meets this Russian woman, Madame Blavatsky, and they create this uh, spiritual thinking in which you are in touch with the masters of the universe. Now, what has that to do with our topic? Uh, these people then think that in the East, you have the masters of the universe. And Madame Blavatsky is able to reach them. She, she claims that she has been to Tibet, probably untrue. She claims that she uh, knows all kinds of uh, ways to, uh, to reach these people and she connects to India. So the first name of the Theosophical Society is the Theosophical Society of the Arya Samaj. The Arya Samaj is a major Hindu reform movement. Then they travel to India and um, they uh, meet uh, the leader of the Arya Samaj and uh, this gentleman thinks that they are humbugs and uh, that they are just fake, that's, that's the humbuggery he calls it. Uh, and um, uh, that you he doesn't want to have anything to do with it. But that doesn't really end the story. Uh, Colonel Alcott becomes one of the major influences on, uh, on Sri Lankan nationalism, on Buddhist nationalism. He writes a Buddhist catechism that is still used in Sri Lanka. The unification of uh, the nationalization of uh, Buddhism as a national religion in Sri Lanka with all the violent effects of the 1980s and so on uh, are, uh, there's a <laughs> big theosophical uh, background there. But it's not all bad uh, because uh, Madame Lavatsky, when she dies, is, is, uh, is succeeded by a woman called Annie Bassent. And Annie Besant becomes the first president of the Indian National Congress. So she's the first president of India's major national anti-colonial force. So they play an enormous role in giving the Indians the idea that they do have a spiritual, spiritual advantage that there is something in their civilization that is better than uh, the civilization of the West, and that uh, you can find that uh, in their sources. That becomes a real, also on Gandhi, uh, a major, uh, major influence. Um, and on someone like Tagore, uh, the poet, uh, uh, is deeply influenced by, uh, by these ideas of a superior uh, spirituality that goes beyond religious institutions. Now, um, people who have studied America here, uh, who, who know something about American literature, uh, they know the transcendentalists, they know, uh, say, Walt Whitman and Emerson and all that. These people are all in the same, interested in the same kind of thing. Uh, basically, they are also pretty radical because they are in this case, in the, in, the, in the European and American case, anti-Christianity, anti-institutions. Now Tagore travels to Japan and to China, and uh, he, in Japan and China, he gets very enthusiastic uh, receptions because he is, um, well, he's a spiritual leader. He looks also completely the part. Uh, have you ever seen a picture of, if you have ever seen a picture of Tagore, he really looks like a, a, a sage. And, um, of course, the Japanese make, cannot really go into this non-violence bit so much uh, in this period. Um, because they are be building up their own army. But the idea of a co-prosperity co sphere uh, that uh, Japan would spread out over China and over the rest of Asia is very much influenced by this idea that the uh, the Japanese have a superior spirituality to offer to the rest of Asia, in which uh, they would get rid of the colonial, uh, uh, 
the colonial suppression. This is still something you see in Japanese uh, thinking uh, if you go to Japan. Um, China, in China, uh, Tagore is also received by um, uh, by uh, Yang Qichao as uh, a major leader. Yang Qichao is very interested himself in the uh, connection with of European philosophy and Buddhism, uh, and sees Buddhism as a uh, more than his, his teacher Kang Youwe uh, uh, wants to go get away from, from Confucianism as the basis of the, of, of, of the nation and sees Buddhism as a, as a good alternative. So he's very interested in that, in that, uh, in that connection. And um, uh, so that is, and I think historically you have to also place that after the First World War. The First World War shows that this whole superior European idea of the idea of uh, European superiority is just unacceptable. It's, it's just a complete. Fa it's clearly a complete fake. They they slaughter each other, uh, the French and the English and the uh, Germans, like anything. It's a huge massacre. So what what are they going to teach us? So the idea that the East may have a spirituality that is superior is, uh, is quite important. Now that's, uh, that, 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 that spirituality is hard to define and can have all kinds of inflections. Uh, you could argue, and I, I would argue, that Maoism also has its own spirituality. <laughs> And uh, that there is something in, uh, in the way people are mobilized and uh, given an enthusiasm for, um, uh, for a utopian China is uh, not only found in, in, in Gandhi, yeah, for, for India, but it's also found in Mao uh, in China. Um, so it's not simply materialism that replaces uh, religion in China. It is a particular kind of spiritual utopianism uh, that is um, uh, uh, world transformative and in which China can be the leader of the world. Um, Indians also have the idea that they are the spiritual superiors and can be the leaders of the non-aligned uh, non movement after, uh, after independence. Uh, so Nehru plays a big role in that, and of course the whole thing collapses when China uh, uh, attacks uh, uh, India in the early 60s. Uh, then the myth of non-alignment and, and of, a, of, a, of an alternative, actually based on a certain kind of civilizational spirituality, an alternative to communism and capitalism, collapses uh, because uh, uh, China would be the brother, right, in this pursuit. Um, but China has a little bit other concerns at that moment. Uh, um, now, if you base nationalism on an idea of civilization, which actually nationalisms in general do, and you nationalize civilization, you say, well, that is actually the Han genius and so on. Uh, you find it also a lot in in, uh, in major anthropological work of the 50s uh, uh, in China. This idea of the Han uh, genius, which is then based also partly on a particular mode of production and so on. Um, when you do that, then the question, the most interesting question from a sociological point of view is, who does not belong to that civilization? There are the people who are not uh, contributors to this. They may be the recipients, which uh, you then also see um, in a lot of uh, writing, but they are not the originators and creators and contributors. And um, that is um, uh, in, in both India and China, these are the so-called foreign religions. Islam and Christianity. They are, in a strange civilizational thinking, not rooted. That then has nothing to do anymore with real history or something. Ah, oh, you cannot, uh, there are Christians already, whenever. 
or they were Muslims already for whenever. That doesn't help. So an argument based on history doesn't help because it's a civilizational argument. It's an argument that there is a civilization that is rooted in the soil that is the basis of the nation and in which some do not, ultimately do not belong. That doesn't mean that you have to eradicate them. <laughs> Although in European history they were quite into this uh, idea of purification and cleansing and eradication. But you can also have them, but they should be knowing their place, which is basically as minor, uh, minor citizen or secondary citizen and so on. This is very clear in, uh, in India. Uh, Muslims have now, in my lifetime, become more and more marginalized. And so it's very hard for them to basically and this is a large part of the population, right? Um, um, to have the full, the full citizenship. Uh, not a formal citizenship, but an, an, an enacted uh, citizenship. In China, uh, well, we have seen all kinds of repressions over time. But of course, the, uh, the attempt to eradicate uh, uh, Uyghur Islam in Xinjiang is, is, I think, a prime example of cultural genocide and is a, is a straightforward uh, attempt to cleanse. Uh, um, <coughs> this does not affect Muslims over the entire country, uh, Hui Muslims over the entire country as yet. But I'm not so sure about that, how that will work out. As I said, the equations are very different. Uh, Muslims are still, after partition in India, are still 13% of the population, uh, once free. And uh, this is, of course, not the case in, in China. Uh, so the numbers are very different. But, um, but I see some of the same uh, patterns here. Christians, um, well, they are we have all these experts here on, on Chinese Christianity, so I don't have much to say about it. But basically, in India, um, uh, Christians are by law now, since the 1950s, not allowed to proselytize. Um, this goes against the in constitution, in fact. Uh, but it, these are enacted, laws enacted at the state level. Uh, and these are specifically the first are always uh, enacted in states in India which have large tribal uh, minorities. Uh, there, uh, this is uh, a big uh, political uh, thing. Um, now, uh, Mao also thought that uh, Christianity was some kind of American imperialism under <laughs> under cover, uh, so it was also all, all also seen as proselytization being a uh, a, a bad uh, thing. So you can have some so-called original Christian, but they should not grow, and that's why Protestantism is of course one of the big uh, hassles uh, because it grows um, and. Um, so you see the same uh, idea, these people do not belong. And therefore, they can maybe be there as long as they accept uh, uh, the civilizational order in which they are not entirely full, full participants, as it were. They are secondary citizens. Um, So I think the, um, uh, there are elements, so um, mass mobilization on, on, on religious basis, like what Gandhi did and what Mao did. There are, there are uh, patterns of, uh, of politics that are very, very similar, although India is seen as a democracy and, uh, and China as, a, as an authoritarian state. Uh, but still, um, uh, ideas of uh, use of religion as political mobilization are in both cases uh, available. The idea of civilization is very central in both uh, nationalism. And uh, 
uh, as you have an idea of civilization, you have also an idea of civilizational outsiders. And with that, I open it up. Thank you. That's so that spiritual, spiritual superiority yeah. and the idea of... Well, politically, it, it was played down, basically, uh, after uh, the early 60s. Um, uh, so the idea that India can play this kind of moral exemplar for international politics, uh, I think two... I, I meant back like 1947, when the nation was divided between the two, and then there's this terrible bloodbath. Yes, of course. Uh, but still, um, uh, Nehru uh, in the Bandung Conference uh, of uh, 1954 and uh, in the uh, creation of the non-aligned movement uh, portrayed India uh, as a, um, a spiritual leader uh, of uh, a spiritual alternative, basically, to uh, capitalism, to the two blocks in the, in the Cold War. Um, the bloodbath, uh, which Gandhi tried to stop in various ways, um, uh, was portrayed as a as a form of Muslim fanaticism, and uh, um, uh, the it was not. Neil somehow was able to 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 continue the idea that um, uh, the Indian National Congress did not want it. They had not wanted it. They did not want a partition. And the partition had come from other parties. And uh, so Jinnah was no, never part of this non-aligned movement. Um, and Jinnah died, of course, also very quickly after the uh, partition. But Pakistan uh, never became part of this whole idea. It was India, Hindu India, which had this, uh, in international politics, this... Uh, what you could call also a pretense, right? It's uh, it's on it's it's not entirely um, from the from the facts of the, wo of the world <laughs> really true, but um, it was of course important to to have this in a period in which you have an enormous uh, opposition in the world between communism and capitalism, uh, so that you did not want to listen either to Moscow or to uh, Washington was an important uh, independence that was claimed from, uh, from India. That, that stops in the early 60s. And uh, uh, India's takeover in, the, in uh, the late 50s of Goa was already a sign that this was, uh, was uh, shaky, uh, that they forced the Portuguese to give it up. And then um, uh, the India-China war made an end to it. That is not to say that, there is, that these ideas are not floating around every now and then. Uh, yeah. That you would maybe also find it with the current prime minister, uh, Modi. But um, it, it's not, it doesn't have the same uh, power, as it were. Where you find spirituality very much is in all kinds of uh, movements that are also connected to India's technological uh, uh, revolution, you may say, uh, in, the, uh, in the IT sphere. So you have all kinds of movements, that, uh, spiritual movements, that are connected to, uh, uh, to the role that India plays in, in software engineering. And um, so it, it is a kind of cosmopolitanism because these people are all trained in the United States and so on and, and uh, have connections with Silicon Valley and so on and, and basically worldwide uh, bring their products but there is some idea that there is a spirituality uh, that is uh, inherent in, in, in their engineering genius <laughs> and that's um, so that is that is to some extent political you can say that that you find also Hindu nationalism rather strongly often among these people. 
And uh, so I think Hindu nationalism in the United States, I, I don't have the real evidence for that, but <laughs> also has spread through engineering and business schools. So, um, uh, so there's a support for the Hindu nationalist idea <coughs> of some kind of spiritual nature um, uh, among uh, professionals, you can say. Okay, so let me uh, uh, have a couple of comments and ask a question, because this is really a very rare opportunity <laughs> to have you here, so it would be uh, good to have some of your questions. First of all, I uh, really admire you for doing the comparisons of India, China versus Europe. I mean, from European background, of course, always have that in back of your mind thinking when you study India or China. I think this uh, kind of uh, effort or enterprise uh, really belongs to the great minds. I can only think of uh, Max Weber has done this, compared China, India, and uh, the West. Or recently, Robert Bala mm -hmm. is the one who tried to have a grasp of the whole world, mm -hmm. or the until the actual thing. Um, so really admire this, and I really dare not uh, feel know so little about India. And actually, uh, for me, I have been reluctant to even take on uh, Europe. Uh, so I started <coughs> my research uh, on religion in the US, and I was reluctantly invited to Europe, began to think broader, uh, you know, uh, put Europe in the picture as well. And recently, I've been uh, uh, working to organize the East Asia Society for the Scientific Study of Religion and uh, come up with the idea of the Global East. And part of the reason, well, Global East basically are the societies more or less influenced by Confucianism. That's another way to think about it. So it, it's uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia, and also the diaspora from that part of the world in, 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 uh, in different countries. Uh, part of the reason not including India in the new association is we don't know, <laughs> too much to know, it's too hard. So we limited ourselves to the global east. So uh, just want, that's a comment, it's uh, uh, my admiration for your, this effort. Second one, I feel, yeah, it is very helpful for your point uh, to think about modern times, uh, uh, European nations and the rest of the world come to uh, under self-understanding in reference to colonialism, either colonizers or colonized. And perhaps also the colonizers' competition with each other define the European nation states. And then they define African, different nations, different ethnic groups, and also uh, Asia. So I find that very helpful, very, you know, it's, uh, it's resonant. Think about uh, uh, what's the modern understanding of peoplehood. Yeah, it's a lot related to colonialism on both sides. But that's uh, where I also wonder, maybe you can clarify a little bit. Uh, can we understand China with the uh, understanding of India? Because India was fully colonized. China was not. Partly, you know, Hong Kong, Macau, and those concessions. Uh, that's actually, uh, I began to have this uh, thinking when we had a meeting in uh, Hanover. Mm -hmm. I felt European scholars have a pretty good grasp of the former colonies, Southeast Asia, even Vietnam, you know, the French felt the no, right? And, um, but for China and Japan, it's so hard to really understand them. And even difficult to develop terminologies to understand 
uh, China, Japan, perhaps also Korea. Uh, so, uh, so I want to. This is more for research. How, how do you do research? When you begin to approach China, what are the struggles? Uh, do you see uh, that can make some difference because of the different uh, relationship with uh, with colonialism or the colonizers versus being fully colonized or partially colonized. Um, the last one is, a, is, a, is more a real question. <laughs> uh, last week, uh, Francis uh, Fukuyama came. What, is that last week? This week? <laughs> Only this week, yeah, two days ago. <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, he gave a lecture here, he gave a talk, and we had some good discussions, good questions and answers. Uh, his presence actually made me wonder, uh, do we humans have one history or multiple histories? Uh, James Huntington began to talk about the seven different civilizations. They are essentially different. And so that defines the uh, uh, world uh, politics. But when uh, Francis Fukuyama uh, uh, published the book, of the end of history, basically claiming there's only one history of humankind, and this is the end of uh, political I political idealism. There's you know liberal democracy is the destiny for the humankind. Well, now he clarifies it. He says you know this is the idea come from Marx, and and uh, before Marx uh, that came from Hegel. You know, thinking, religion, uh, thinking, um, uh, humankind, uh, social development will have one last form. For Marx, that was communism. Now he says it's not communism; it's really liberal democracy. Mm. Now he says, yeah, you know, maybe China uh, presents a real alternative to this <laughs> liberal democracy, uh, even though people may not like it. But it looks like viable, uh, at least uh, for now, we see there's no way, very hard to see a way of change in China towards uh, this liberal democracy. So uh, I don't know, I feel uh, I've been struggling this week, uh, thinking about this. Do we humans have one history? Yeah, of course, there are cultural differences, even civilization differences, but are we essentially the same? humans, when humans come together, interact with each other, uh, do we have basics the same? Feeling, thinking, and uh, that. So, okay, I feel growing up in China, I acquired, uh, yeah, acquired a universalism. It starts with the Marxist universalism. And then moved on to the classic ones, uh, Hegel, Kant, that, uh, that kind of universalism. Coming to the U.S., uh, lived in the U.S. for 30 years, it's another type of universalism. That can be somewhat American imperialism, right? But still trying to see, trying to think about the world, is the world is, is belongs to one humankind, or is, is destined, destined to be you know, divided into different civilizations. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's, it's a puzzle for me. Uh -huh. uh, so when you have, because you have taken on the three major ones um, of, the, of, of what Huntington talked about, the seven civilizations, what's your sense of this? Is this mm -hmm. one or more? of uh, civilization or human culture. I don't know how to even define it. Mm. So. Yeah, thank you. That <coughs> I think, uh, theoretically, I would uh, be against essentializations. And um, uh, Fukuyama made some uh, career on essentializations. And this is already in Hegel. And so the Geist is in a particular uh, people and uh, cannot be found in another 
people. Uh, uh, so history moves with the leadership of the Germans or the French, uh, Napoleon, uh, whoever he sees that incorporates the, uh, the spirit of the time. Uh, makes no sense to me. And I've never seen communism as, a, a, as uh, one thing. Uh, they started fighting each other for uh, every, every step. Uh, the Chinese, the, the Russians, the Vietnamese. This is the insight that Ben Anderson had, who also came from a leftist background and then saw that there was no brotherhood of communism and that uh, they all were basically nations and uh, try to create independent nations and that therefore the communists of Vietnam have one primer, uh, primary enemy which is not the Americans, it's the Chinese. So that's, that's, that's an insight that, that Anderson basically, you, when you read his introduction to, uh, to imagine communities, you will see that. It's a, against his political views, <laughs> he and Perry Anderson come from, uh, from a certain kind of background that did not want to have it like that, but basically you saw that it was like that. So these essentialism that communism is now finished, the, the, bo uh, the Berlin Wall has has collapsed and now we are in a happy new... Li and what is liberal democracy? Let me see a little bit more, more precise how democratic processes work in different societies. It's not such an easy uh, thing. You have to engage populism uh, much more theoretically and uh, it's not that easy uh, to do it from uh, the institutions of, uh, of elections or the, the mechanisms of elections. You have to have another uh, understanding. So, so much for Fukuyama. Uh, very successful, but basically not really useful uh, to think this even. Um, the question, the, so if you don't think in essences, you think in his historical pathways. You, you think in history, right? You think historically. And uh, the pathways of India and China obviously are very different. And... Uh, where they are comparable is that at the end of the nation uh, of the 19th century, they are both forced to create nation states. They cannot escape. This is almost Hegelian. <laughs> there is the geist of the nation you have to uh, in, uh, to deal with, and that's what this whole whole struggle is about. Now, the struggle in India is to get rid of the British. The British quit India was the movement. Get them out after the First World War. Then, of course, after the boxers, which they tried to get the uh, imperialists out, basically was not any more an option. Uh, uh, the, uh, the struggle develops, of course, from internal regional fighting into an anti-Japanese struggle, uh, and. Um, uh, you can see the Japanese definitely as colonial, as colonizers, uh, and they would, well, it's the same thing as India, it's difficult to colonize these places, uh, but they would, uh, if they would have been successful, they would have tried to colonize it. And uh, so, if you say, well, China was not colonized, India was colonized, that is true, and that's also important, it's not unimportant. But the institutions of the modern nation-state are brought into place in both places. They are, so in terms of ideology, but also in terms of effective ideology, of institutional, uh, very much the same. The ideas are the same. Uh, they have to deal with, with Western ideas of modernity. Um, uh, it is largely an internal struggle. Uh, this is often misunderstood with colonialism. Uh, it, people see it only as a nation trying to get rid of the French or the Dutch or the... Uh, basically, it tries to form itself, which means I a huge civil war, in fact. And uh, that is true for India and China, for Vietnam, for everywhere. Uh, 
so you have different kinds of options uh, that are being played out. And of course, part of that is to get rid of these imperialists. This is true for China too. Uh, but uh, when you do that, at the same time, you have to get rid, actually more important, in China of the nationalists and the Kuomintang and so on. Uh, so there's much more in common. Uh, colonizers also have a very little, a very small footprint on societies. There may have been 10,000 uh, uh, English officers. Look at it, small England. Colonizing the entire world, it's just unbelievable. It ha must have been done by the people themselves. So they have the Bengalis and the, the rest and so on who are doing the real work. That's also very much similar to the, the Chinese case because Chinese are, al are also colonizing themselves. Right? So um, uh, I think there's more in common than, than uh, say, colonialism versus non-colonialism, imperialism. It's, uh, it uh, has much more in common, in fact. Okay, yes. Back, but uh, I just read it really yesterday. And uh, I've been always been fascinated by the idea of uh, religious nationalism. You know, like, uh, even here in the States, like, after the election of Trump, people talk about, like, what makes America, you know. Right. The, uh, you know, in America, it's uh, you know, a major historical event, like, the election of Trump. Maybe people will see, okay, basically, a good time to study, like, nationalism uh, is, you know, kind of revising the, uh, the, uh, revitalizing the topic. Uh, I'm curious, like, in the case of China, you know, you were in conversation with Dr. Yang about like uh, Christianity and Confucianism uh, uh, as a civil religion, mm. you know, to like uh, kind of civilized nation basis for China. So I just want to, you know, but it's hard to study this topic because, uh, you know, right now it's mostly focused uh, on level of discourse. It's really cannot be translated into any uh, uh, like voting behavior or anything because mm -hmm. like uh, those people who talk about this, you know, like uh, the cultural nationalism of Confucians, mm -hmm. you know, Martin Luther Confucianists, uh, Christian nationalism, mm -hmm. all sorts of people on the elite level, they talk a lot about this thing, but actually, you know, on the public levels, really, it's not really much happening. Mm -hmm. And, <coughs> you know, how to capture this if we were to study this? And methodologically, how to capture this kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Well, it's happening, there's no, well, uh, there's no major event. Mm -hmm. There's nothing much on the ground. Mm -hmm. It's uh, pretty much in a discursive form at this moment. Mm -hmm. So that's my ma major idea. Yeah. Well, there are, there are obviously e also events, and um, and that is something. Actually, my uh, my second son did his MA thesis on uh, on anti-Japanese um, demonstrations in uh, China. Uh, so basically, there, there you are. There you have an event. You 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 can interview people. You can also try to find out who has organized it. What the relation to the, between the party uh, or the state is and and the organizers of these things and so on. So these are events of nationalism, so you can say uh, mobilizations that are uh, around certain kinds of of issues. Uh, so Vietnam, the anti-Chinese demonstrations and so on and so forth. Common banal nationalism is always difficult to cap uh, capture. But, but but I find very, uh, right now, I mean, if I would be able to do any any real empirical good research in, in China, I would be really interested in finding out what Han people think about Uyghur and what they think about what is going on in Xinjiang. Uh, and uh, you don't have to only do that in Xinjiang, you can also do that in, in Gansu and, you, and, and, and areas around it and so on. So a, a certain understanding of, of our, uh, uh, what the acceptance is of policies uh, that are purported to be um, uh, favorable to the nation or good for the nation, protecting the nation, uh, anti-terrorist discourses in Europe, for example. Uh, what do people actually think of Muslims? Are they now suddenly all becoming seen as, as terrorists and so on? Um, so 
So there you, you can actually, and of course depends on your, uh, on your methodological inclinations, you can try to do that through surveys. Uh, I am a little bit kind of a stodgy anthropologist, so basically I don't believe that what, I, what, every, what anyone says on survey. When I, was a, when I was a student, I got extra money by asking people uh, about their electrical um, uh, things in their house, what they, whether they needed a second uh, refrigerator or something. I filled these things myself in, and then I got uh, money. <laughs> 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 so, um, uh, surveys, well, of course you get the counter-argument too. And you sit in this little place, you sit in uh, what I have been doing a little bit in Yunnan and so on, and uh, you sit in a place and you ask a couple of people and you think that it represents China? <laughs> it's also ridiculous. So representativeness is, is, is an issue. I think good research, but I also think it's a very interesting thing to do in what, what Frank Pieke has been doing in, uh, he was now in Berlin, he's a Dutchman who works on China, uh, on cadre schools. What actually is being taught in the education of political cadres? Uh, that is accessible, the, uh, at least for some. Uh, Frank has been doing that for Yunnan uh, cadre schools, uh, but and he has a recent piece which I've not re yet, re read yet on uh, Chinese civil religion in. Uh, either the American ethnologist or in the Journal of the Royal Anthropological Institute, uh, but uh, he has, uh, uh, so he, if you ask me the methodological question, where can you study things, I think it is very important to study how um, Communist Party cadres are trained. And what came out of his, his earlier study is that a lot of um, business school understandings of the world management uh, uh, theories are being taught in these schools. Um, now, how do you connect ma management uh, theories to nationalism? That is an interesting question. But I'm pretty sure that that is true for Indian schools also. And, uh, so there are, I think, sites, I would call them sites and events that uh, give you possibility to do what I want to do, is ethnographic research. Um, now, you can also look at, at, at archives, of course, uh, if you have a historical uh, perspective, and, and, uh, and see what, what the archive says about the negotiations that people have. Because I never have believed that it is all of one cloth. It's all uh, rather negotiated at local levels. It, Chris's work is very clear about that. that I mean, you can just not simply speak about the, the suppression of Christians. It's, it's a negotiation that plays there are cadres who are in your own village which you have to deal with or you have officials with whom you have other kinds of connections. In, 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 in India and China everything is negotiable um, unless there's a big campaign or unless there's a big central government or higher government uh, dictate and then of course these negotiations break down on, on that basis. So I think there's much more opportunity. The, 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 the hassle, the real hassle today is that it will become more and more difficult to do ethnographic research again. Uh, India was quite open in the past, not open anymore. China is, was not open in the past, then opened up a little bit and becomes closer now. Uh, so how can we get any empirical data on anything if we are not, so we now need citizens of these, these societies to do that work and you bring them also into danger uh, because they have family living there and so on. So it's the, the, uh, what I would call the hassle of empirical research has just increased enormously and that's why you can have a large essentialization and laugh your way to the bank but uh, real nitty-gritty uh, uh, ethnographic and historical research, <laughs> difficult, very practical, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. So I have a question about 
what makes religion part of the civilization because that you, you mentioned that Christianity and Islam are not part of Chinese civilization, but that can change. So, so mm -hmm. like we, we, we looked at look at Buddhism and historically, I mean, it was a, also a foreign religion. True. And so, is it something from above or something from below? What makes something part of that and related to that? What are your thoughts on the recent sinicization of religion in China? The, the project that's more state directed to try to make Chinese religions more Chinese. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that last thing is what it is, right? It's uh, this um, uh, nationalization of of civilization. So it's not civilization from a scholar's point of view. Obviously, Islam and Buddhism and Christianity have been huge influences on Chinese civilization and are completely part of it from a scholarly point of view. But from a nationalist point of view, you look at a much more narrow understanding of that civilization, which is the heart of your nationalism. And, uh, and that's arbitrary. Uh, and that requires some special way of thinking, as it <coughs> were, uh, in which you try to ignore certain kind of historical facts and highlight other historical facts. Also, the idea that, that I've always resisted the idea of China having a Confucian civilization. First of all, I'm not so sure what I, whether I really understand what Confucian is. Uh, but it's, it is clear to me that when I go to Fujian and Yunnan, and these are the, the areas of, of China I've been to for more regularly, and then basically, uh, yeah, there's also some Confucian Im influence. There's all kinds of influences. But basically, these are all lo local religions and local traditions that have tried to, to express themselves in an idiom that can be understood out also outside of it, but is also partly completely ununderstandable for people who come from outside. So uh, they are, in that sense, very local and regional. But they are obviously in conversation with a larger civilizational world, uh, of which they are a part. But uh, as soon as you get ideas that you can repress things, as uh, Xie Jiao or uh, any form of uh, protest against uh, the powers that be, then it suddenly is not anymore part of the civilization, right? It's, uh, then it's a danger. And... Um, so uh, it's, it's nom nominalistic, it is, uh, it is uh, politically uh, uh, motivated what is th the definition of who belongs to the civilization, of what belongs to the civilization and what not. The other question of, of, of what is the relation between religion and civilization, that's al always a, a complex business, well, that, because this religion term is such a late term, it's, it's such a very specific European term uh, in which we still look for certain kinds of institutions that carry it and uh, some kind of definitional unity and so on. So we use the word religion and immediately we try to crawl under the, out of, under the rock, right? It's, it's, it's a kind of heavy, heavy thing with, basically my, my feeling is Religion in India and China are, are in a way protean. They are everywhere, and they are not. Uh, uh, they are sometimes inst instantiated in a particular cult or a particular moment or uh, temple visits or so. But people just have all kinds of religious ideas, which I still call religious ideas, which you also could call civilizational ideas about what happiness is and what, what the goals of life are and what, what should be done, what should, no, should not be done, what should be avoided and so on. Conduct of life that is based on living in a particular set of traditions. And, um, and to divide them into n religious and non-religious, I think, is a pursuit where you will not be happy. This will not really work. Uh, 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 the old debate about Chinese religion whether it's based on belief you know, uh, 
is believe an important category for Chinese religion. Well, is it an important category for other kinds of? Be uh, it's sometimes an important uh, for some forms of Protestantism. It's an, it's an important form, but also not for every. Uh, also, being just taken by the spirit can be more important than than belief as such. Belief is it can be <coughs> a very rational thing, right? So I think we have to be careful um, splitting up things. Uh, and that's why the civilization thing is also a little bit more capacious. It's things that, that are, have been divided in sec into secular, magic, religious, and so on, and spiritual, are all under the rubric. And what I've tried to show in that book, the Modern Spirit of, uh, of Asia, that is th these categories, they shift constantly. Things that were religious at some time become magical at another time, or they become spiritual, or they become secular, and then also mo can move back. So, um, yeah, these, 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 these are uh, shifting categories. So that's why the, the question of what, what is the relation between religion and civilization is, is, is not in, ways, in, in, in fact, a kind of unsolvable question. There's a kind of vagueness in these things that, that I understand that people who are, have a rational bent of mind find that unpleasant. Uh, because you cannot really make a model very easily on it. Um, but uh, I cannot do otherwise. I mean, I'm just stuck with this reality yeah, that is not so fixable. Uh, I'm more of an historian in that sense. That uh, you just go with the flow of the of the, your documents or your archive. And you try to be as honest to it as possible, and then it's very hard to categorize things. Uh, so this, uh, yeah, I just want to uh, follow uh, up with this one. Um, yeah, religion is a constructed, modern times constructed concept or category. Uh, but uh, India, China, Japan, uh, non-European countries have to struggle to construct their religion. Mm. Uh, because you're the expert uh, look, uh, who have looked at different uh, civilizations, I always have this uh, wonder: why, um, uh, relatively speaking, uh, the construction of Hinduism is pretty successful, but not so on Confucianism as religion. Even the Chinese do not mm. accept that. Mm. Uh, but you know, at least the Hindus mm. think Hinduism is really like a religion. Mm. 